All right, so we started off there, obviously reading the entire chapter of Luke chapter 1. I think it's very fitting. Yes, it's a long chapter. Yep, it's 80 verses, and we read the entire chapter in church. You know, isn't that what, what church is supposed to be about during the, the teaching time and sermon time? It's supposed to be looking at the Word of God, right? It's not just man's opinion. I'm not, I'm not supposed to just come up here and just tell you all about my life and stories and everything else. We're looking at the Word of God, and we're studying the Word of God, and we understand the Word of God, and that's, this is what we want to know. So, um, I'm starting a new series, and if you've been coming here for a while, you know my series, sometimes they aren't always on schedule, on course. I don't, I don't set it up to always have a specific time where I go through things, and I may just end up stopping it whenever I end up stopping it. But there's, a, there's something I'm really interested in now, and I think it's going to be really valuable for the whole church in general. And I'm titling this series more about Jesus. Okay, Now, Obviously, the Bible's full of, of doctrines and teachings, and all these things are very important. You know, understanding, you know, teachings on sin and the law and, and a variety of different things. But I'm going to be spending some time going through a lot of foundational truths, and we're going to be starting with going through titles that are applied to Jesus Christ and why they're applied and, and why it matters and things like that. So wh where I'm starting off this morning is we're talking about the Son of Man and the Son of God. Both of those phrases are used to refer to Jesus Christ. He's referred to as the Son of Man. He's referred to as the Son of God. All throughout the New Testament, you're going to see that. And we're going to cover a lot of basic truths today, but just as you know, Luke chapter 1 is packed full of great doctrine about Jesus Christ, we're going to, you know, we started off there. And I just want to explain this concept first, because what we're going to do is we're going to look at some, some passages that go over the humanity of Jesus Christ, because look, it's important to understand who our Savior is. And that's why I'm doing this whole series, right? This more about Jesus. I want to just focus on, on everything as much as possible about Jesus so that we make sure that we're solid in understanding of who he is. Because let's face it, there's a lot of people out there that are teaching all kinds of different things about Jesus Christ, supposedly, that give you a false idea of who Christ is for, for a variety of different reasons, too. So what we're teaching today and what you want to understand today is one of the most basic and fundamental truths in Christianity Yet there are still people out there that would teach against this and don't teach this truth. And they're, they're mostly the cults, the cults of um, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons that won't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. Okay, so and, and what this sermon's going to do is we're going to look at a lot of verses that talk about the humanity of Christ. And this is why they're wrong is because they only look at those and say, well, he can't be God because of whatever. But then we're also going to look at all the verses that talk about him being deity, about him being God, and understanding that Jesus Christ is God. But yes, he was also in the flesh and he was a man too. And we're going to look at the man Christ Jesus. We're going to look at God Christ Jesus. One person, right? One Savior. We're going we're to look at, at a lot of passages about that. And before we even get started in Luke 1, you know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. But I want to start off just by saying, you know, there's no controversy about the mystery of godliness, of, of God being manifest in the flesh, is a great mystery. Because hard for us to wrap our human minds around the concept that an infinite, omnipresent God, right, omniscient, omnipresent, all these attributes of God, God cannot be contained, God can, you know, how can, how can a God even become a man. How is that even possible? Well, you know what? It is a great mystery. We don't know exactly how that can come into being, but what we do have is the scripture and the truth telling us the way things are. Right? So we have to there's some things you have to be able to take by faith because the word of God says so. Now, it's not unreasonable faith. It's not just something that's way far off the wall 
to believe that something like that could even be possible, but it is a great mystery on how that can actually happen. So I don't get caught up trying to explain exactly how things can happen. I don't think we can answer that because it's a great mystery and the Bible says so. But there are some things, because we're going to be dealing with the concept of the Trinity today, but just right off the bat, just to throw this out there, why it's not unreasonable, you could think of many, 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 many things in nature that exist that we could all observe that, that are similar in concept to a Trinity of, of beings being one thing, right? Three persons, one God is what we believe. That's the, the orthodox view of, of, of the Godhead, of who God is, and... This isn't just about the Trinity either, because this is we're focusing just on Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. But um, if you think about things, you know, I've heard a lot of people explain things in various ways. You can say, well, an egg consists of the shell, the white, and the yolk, but it's still one egg. You still need all those pieces together to, to you know, really be an egg. But that's how, you know, um, and, and the shell isn't the same as the white, and the white isn't the same as the yolk. They're all different from one another, but it's still one egg. Uh, you can do, I, I oftentimes will use water as an example. Water exists as a, a solid, a liquid, and a gas. You've got ice, you've got steam, and you've got liquid water, but it's all H2O. It's all, it's all consists of that same essence, that same molecular structure. It's H2O. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't change what it is, even though it's in these different forms. And no one of these examples is like absolutely perfect to describe God, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's something to kind of help you wrap your mind around this ability of God to exist as three persons. So um, regardless of how easy you can understand the concept, what's more important is that the Bible says <laughs> what it says. So we're going to be looking at these examples. And I don't want to spend too much time because this, this sermon, like I said, it's not just like about the Trinity. I'm not just teaching a sermon on the Trinity, but we will be covering that. And before we even get started, that's why I wanted to just quote that verse to you about 1 Timothy 3.16. It's a great mystery. Don't get hung up on it. Let's just focus on what the scripture says and let's just believe the scripture for what it says. In Luke chapter 1, because what I'm focusing on now is the difference between the Son of Man and the Son of God. Same person, it's Jesus Christ, right? But why is he called the Son of Man and the Son of God? Well, very simply, very easily, he's called the Son of Man because he was born of a woman and, be, and was made flesh. He became a human being. Jesus Christ became a human being, okay? And, and lived on this earth as a human being. And anyone who had any interaction with him, you can touch him, you can feel him. He had senses and, and, and experienced the life that we experience in the flesh of a human being. He was not in his celestial body. He was not in a different form of flesh. He had flesh and blood and bones and everything that we have, literally, physically, as a human being, born of a virgin. But as we're going to see in Luke chapter 1, why he's also called the Son of God. The reason why he's called the Son of God is because he has no earthly father. Everybody who exists today as a human being on this earth has a biological mother and a biological father. There is no getting around that. I mean, even, even you know, babies who are conceived in a laboratory with a, with a seed of a man and the egg of a woman, you know, they have to come from a father and a mother. They have to come literally get that DNA from both parents and come together and, and, and that child is, is, you know, comes into being from having a physical fa a father, a physical mother. Obviously, Jesus Christ did not have a physical father. Yes, Joseph was called his father on this earth, but Joseph was his stepfather. So look at verse number 31 in Luke chapter 1. This is when the angel came to, to speak to Mary and kind of talk to her about this and tell her about um, her great, um, you know, what she has been chosen for, her, her great ministry, what she's been selected to do as a, as a godly woman was to literally raise and, and, and carry and bring to term that Jesus Christ, right? That's a, that's a, a great honor to be able to, to be the one to do that. She had, you know, some vessel had to be chosen and Mary was chosen to do that. Verse number 31, the Bible reads, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. So Jesus is, was conceived in the womb. Like, I mean, we all were conceived in the womb at one point, but verse number 32 says, He shall be great 
and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So this is where he's saying he's going to be called the Son of God, basically Son of the Highest. Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She said, Well, how is it possible I'm going to bring, I'm going to give forth, bring forth a child? How can I give birth when I haven't, when she says I haven't known a man, he's talking about she hasn't laid with a man. She hasn't, she's a virgin, right? She, I've, I've never been with a man, so how is this possible? Right? In every other context on this earth, it's impossible. Women aren't just having children without, without having being supplied with, with the seed of a man. Just impossible, right? Well, that's why it's a miraculous birth, but it's still a conception. The Bible says in verse 35, this is key, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the conception comes from the Holy Ghost, you know, creating that being that the the human being in her womb that could making that conception again i'm trying to be careful with my words because you don't want to say the wrong thing but no one exactly knows how that conception takes place right there's there's no way of of, of understanding completely how that got, and i can't stand up here today and tell you you know, down to the DNA level and the micro level of, of how the composition of Jesus Christ and his body. I don't know. I don't know how that happened, right? But we do know that Jesus Christ was God, is God, was God in the flesh, 100%. He was God. But simultaneously, he is a man. He's a human being as well. And that's what the Bible teaches uh, over and over again. But we see that there. This is why he's called the Son of God, because his Father is God in heaven, right? And he's called the Son of Man because Mary, literally, physically, was his mother. I mean, that, that, that came through, the physical part came from Mary. So um, that's how you can be called both. Now, a lot of interesting things. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 12. There's lots of false doctrine surrounding this, and it's actually no surprise because it's such a foundational, fundamental doctrine, understanding who Jesus is. You know, people can preach Jesus, but if you have the wrong Jesus, you've got the wrong Savior, you don't got the Savior, you don't have the right Jesus, you need to, you know, we believe salvation is very simple. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Very simple. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It doesn't require you to do anything. It doesn't require you to submit yourself and be in obedience and follow the law and do all these works. It's as simple as receiving a free gift. It's as simple as taking a drink of water. It's as simple as eating a piece of bread. It's as simple as walking through a door. It's simple. It's not complicated. You just put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you and you're saved. But you have to believe in the right Savior. He's not, just, he's not just a man that happened to lead a really good life and was a good teacher and someone that we could listen to and learn from. It was, he wasn't just that. Like, like as if you or I or anyone else could potentially just be exactly as good as Jesus Christ was. Impossible. Because he was God. That's why Jesus himself said, there is none good but one. That is God. He said, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. So it, was Jesus good? You better believe it. He says, which of you can convinceth me of sin? Right? He, he, Jesus was without sin. 1 Peter chapter 2 says that Jesus was without sin. Of course he was good because he was God. Now you turn to Matthew chapter 12, just a little bit more kind of regarding the Trinity here and just understanding, though, that there is differences because we're going to continue to go through some passages about Jesus Christ specifically. And you see, especially through the Gospels, the relationship between the Son and the Father. And there's no denying that relationship. 
And there is a difference between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. There's differences, right? But it's still one God. And we, and we don't want to get overboard on either direction, right? Because you can get too overboard on the oneness side of things to where all of a sudden now there is no distinction at all between the Father, the Son, well, it's all just one, and there could be a hundred, or there could be a thousand, or whatever. That's not true. There can't just be a hundred, or a thousand, or whatever, because God just could be manifest in however many ways He chooses. Because God is three persons in one. That's it. There is, there's no choice in the matter. There's no God deciding to be different than who He is already. And at the same, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, there's all these differences between Jesus and the Father, and he's praying to the Father and everything else, that he must not be God then. That's false also. Right. And just to demonstrate some of that difference here, that, that this whole oneness idea is completely debunked, just even in, just in, in one passage, one reference in Matthew 12, look at verse number 31, the Bible says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, if Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the Father were just literally just all, all one where there's no distinction between them, essentially, then how could you make this type of distinction saying, and look at verse 32, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, referring to Jesus, it shall be forgiven him. So if someone speaks against Jesus Christ, that's a forgivable sin. It's still a sin, but that's a forgivable sin. It says, But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That can't be possible unless you have a very serious distinction between the Son of Man and the Holy Spirit and the Father for that matter. Amen. So they can't just all be interchangeable with one another, just impossible. Impossible. Otherwise, this would not make sense at all. Without even going into, well, what is the sin against? It doesn't matter. We're just identifying that there's a, there's a clear distinction here between, between the three. Jump down to verse number 40. There's another interesting concept, and I'm not going to delve too deep into this, but a lot of people will try to draw, make the only distinction about Jesus Christ being God is just the fact that he was in the flesh. Like, that's the only distinction, right? Well, and think about this. If the Son of Man, the reason why we call him the Son of Man is because he was literally born of the Virgin Mary and the Son of God because God is his Father. I preach a sermon on the, the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ that he's always been a son. And I want to show you a couple references here that... Jesus Christ still being referred to as the Son of Man talks about him still being the Son of Man even when he's not in the flesh. Okay, so, and, and it's, you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you're going to say the only thing that made it, makes him different, the only distinction is that he was in the flesh as opposed to, you know, being in the Spirit, you can't, you'd have to say, you wouldn't be able to do it this way. Here, and, and look at verse number four. Look at what it says here. To be a little bit more clear when we look at the scripture. The Bible says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now we know that when Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth, it's when his soul went to hell, right? His body was buried in a tomb. His flesh did not descend into hell. It was in that tomb for those three days and three nights that he was dead, yet he's still referred to as the Son of Man being in the heart of the earth. So not his quote-unquote flesh part being there, but it's still, why is he being called the Son of Man if it's just his soul being there, right? It's, it's because he embodies being the Son of Man and the Son of God simultaneously, regardless of if, if he's cloaked in his flesh. Does that make sense? Hopefully. And even in, uh, in Matthew 19, verse 28, there's a reference to the millennium where he's also being referred to as the Son of Man. So after he's resurrected, after he's put on his glorified body, right, still being referred to as the Son of Man, Matthew 19, verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, 
that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, again, referring to himself as the Son of Man in the future. And then... Um, A few more of references here. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. Because the Son of Man is not a demeaning title at all. Now, what's interesting, when you look at the Son of Man reference, if you just look for the phrase or the exact phrase, you know, Son of Man, in the Old Testament, You'll find it really frequently in, in Ezekiel, but it's always just referring to regular human beings. Like Ezekiel, so, oh, son of man, son of man, son of man, son of man. And we're going to get to this in a minute, but there is one place where it's, where it's actually talking about Jesus Christ as the son of man, even in the Old Testament. And then, um, but in the New Testament, every time you see son of man, it's talking about Jesus Christ. Every occurrence of son of man, it's referring to Jesus. So that's kind of interesting when you look at the, the difference between the two, but it's still not completely blank in the Old Testament of Son of Man reference to Jesus being prophesied as being the, the Christ coming in the flesh. But the Son of Man, the Bible says in Matthew 9, 6, I'll return to this, or uh, you could just stay in Hebrews 4. The Bible says, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, and say to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. Jesus Christ obviously had these miraculous powers on this earth, and he's trying to demonstrate, hey, you need to understand the Son of Man, talking about himself, I've got the power to forgive sins on earth, demonstrating his godliness. Matthew 12, 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. So the fact that he's the Son of Man He's still demonstrating that he's God in the flesh as well. John 3.13 says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as he's speaking those words, it's another amazing concept to great being the mystery of godliness, that God being manifest in the flesh, that Jesus Christ standing on the earth and having a conversation um, with Nicodemus saying that, you know, no one's ascended up into heaven. He says, but, the, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man himself, which is in heaven. So he's, he's making this statement saying the Son of Man is in heaven while he's standing on earth and having a conversation. Again, it's not easy to necessarily wrap your mind around this because we're not in heaven. right? If, we, if, if we're going to be talking to someone, we're right here, right now. We're not just like, can be anywhere or everywhere at once. But Jesus Christ, again, in another example, that he fully embodied God, being God in the flesh. God's the only one that's capable of things. And God's the only one of, of ascending up to heaven. And that word ascending, it's not just a going up, but it's, it's a going up of your own power. It's an ascension that's like, you know, if I were to just levitate myself off the ground and, and float up, that's what that's referring to. The people who have gone to heaven, nobody ascends to heaven on their own. And when you read the Bible, I preach on this in the past, angels are there to take you to heaven. We see that with Elijah in Scripture where the, where the chariots of fire showed up and they took Elijah and he went up to heaven in a whirlwind, right? And you, you see examples of that in Scripture. The, the angels are going to be reaping at, at the second coming of Jesus Christ, at the rapture, they're going to be there to, to reap the earth, to, to carry the, the, the souls of, of the saved up to heaven. And um, on and on. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. There's a lot of evidence for that. But I had you turn to Hebrews chapter 4. One of the reasons also why the Son of Man title is important, though, is for us to understand that our Savior, that our God knows us intimately and knows what it's like to be a human being. Not just as the creator, not just as someone who's designed our bodies and designed, you know, this world and designed everything else, which he did. Amazingly, by the way, when you look at, the, at how amazing our, our just biology is, how our bodies work and what the human body is capable of going through. I'm amazed just looking at, you know, my wife who's, who's had that knee replacement and what your, the trauma your body can withstand 
and heal and recover. I mean, some of you have seen the, 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 the photo of that huge gash, that, that big incision that was made where they rip open the body, put in a new, you know, a prosthetic piece, body part, and then close it back up and sew it up. But to do such damage, but God designed our body to be able to, you know, all the cells, all the things that we probably, current science doesn't even know about working together to be able to just close up and then heal up and, 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 and make that wound just be healed and recover. It, it's, it's incredible. And that's just one little thing. I mean, there's so many aspects of our bodies and how we're made, right? That's that the amount of intelligence behind that is way beyond our comprehension. Right. And then the things that we need just growing out of the earth and, you know, being consumed. You're getting a physical thing being consumed and then, and then being, you know, on and on and on. I can, I'm kind of a nerd in that way. I could go on and on about how amazing that stuff is. But when we look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, this goes even beyond that level of knowledge and understanding from maybe more of a technical or scientific standpoint of how our bodies work and everything because Jesus Christ actually became, you know, God became a man. And not just like, a, like some robot, some weird transplant to a physical body, but like the, the, all the experiences that we go through, emotions, pain, tiredness, you know, like, like everything that you experience and feel, Jesus Christ had that same experience and understands exactly what it means to be in our shoes. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, right, where our weaknesses is, where, where we have pain, where we have suffering, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be put in situations. He knows what it's like to go through this human experience that we go through and our shortcomings and our failings. He knows what it's like to be brought to those points, yet he was able to do it all without sin, right? Because he's God, because he's perfect, because he is without sin. He was able to do these things, but he understands. And having someone who understands, on the one hand, for us, we should be able to look at that and say, okay, well, here's our example, right? Right? We know we're not God, but he gave us the example that it is possible to still be in this flesh and, and be able to make the right choices and do what's right because he did it. But it also tells us we have a God that understands us. And so many people in the world today go through different traumatic experiences where they're going to feel like nobody understands me. Nobody knows where I'm coming from. And they might look at family or friends and not want to confide and not want to you know, receive help because they think nobody understands what I'm going through. No one's been through what I've been through. It's a common thought in people's mind. But you know what? We have a Savior. We have a God that does know exactly what it's like to go through the feelings and the emotions that you're going through. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He knows what it's like. He knows how hard things can be. He knows by being here and being in the, in the, the form of a man. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 22. We're going to see this demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ that, you know, we could think about God not being constrained by flesh saying, oh, well, it's easy for God, right? Because he's God. But when Jesus took on that form of human flesh and was born of a virgin, don't forget, he had all the needs that the flesh requires being on this earth. He needed food and sustenance. You know, like God in heaven, God the Father doesn't need food. He doesn't need anything for him to continue and be sustained. Right? We're, our human existence, we need, we need food, we need water, we, need, you know, we have basic necessities to keep us alive, to, to, to continue life. God is life. God, has, you know, God doesn't need anything for him to continue. God just is. But when Jesus Christ came to this earth and, and the, was conceived in the womb, he needed then the things 
that we need and experiences that need. Now, obviously, there's still that aspect of him being God to where, of course, he's going to continue. He's never going to cease to exist, ever. He can't. But you know what? As human beings, we never cease to exist either, right? So when we physically die, our souls are going to carry on into eternity, whether you're saved or not. Now, obviously, if you're not saved, it's not going to be a good existence because your soul is bound for hell. But it's still going to continue. And then if you're saved, of course, you get to, you get to spend your eternity with the Lord. But um, Jesus Christ needed, you know, felt the, the needs of the flesh. And, and those had to be sustained in order for him to continue. And in fact, we could see the humanity, the human part of Jesus' nature when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and was facing what he knew. He knew what he was facing. He knew what he was going to have to go through. He knew the price he had to pay. He knew everything that was going to happen to him to, to some extent. I don't know exactly to every last detail or not, but he knew what he had to do. He knew he had to be crucified. He knew he had to suffer. He knew he had to be whipped. He knew he had to do all this stuff to fulfill Scripture and to ultimately pay for our sins. But that's being in the flesh and knowing what's, what the pain and everything else, the agony and the suffering that's going to go along with that. You know, if you knew you had to go through something like that, no one's going to want to do that in the flesh. Even the craziest person's not going to want to go through that. You know, I mean, it's just, it, people might say things because they want to look tough or whatever, but, but nobody wants to go through, if you know you're going to have to be, have nails driven through your hands and your feet, and just hanging on a cross and an open shame and having, you know, like no, no one is going to want to go through that. Okay. And we see that just as much as, you know, we could think about them and be like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Jesus didn't want to either in the sense of if it were possible to do, to accomplish the same goal a different way, he would want to do it a different way. Right? So there wasn't anything wrong or sinful about Jesus not wanting to go through it because it's not that he didn't want he, it's not that he wouldn't go through it. And it's not that he didn't want to die for the sins of the whole world. It's just, hey, if there's another way of doing this, I would rather do it another way. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you accomplish the same exact goal and do it a slightly different way and that's gonna be a little bit less painful for you, great. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinful, but just the fact that it's even a concern of his demonstrates the humanity, right. right? Look at Luke 22, verse number 41. This is when he's in the garden. Verse number 41 says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing. So right off the bat we see it's, it's not, he, he doesn't want to do anything contrary to the will of the Father at all. So if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, this is also an important verse to understand about the distinctions between Jesus Christ and the Father because you can see two wills being present here. Jesus... His will, his desire, is to not have to go through all of that suffering and torture and torment, but he is keeping his will in line with the Father's will. And you know what? They're always in unison. Part of that three in one, the will of the, the Holy Ghost, the Father and the Son, are always in unison. But they do have separate wills, making them, that's why we call three persons one God, because you have uh, a, a different will here. And he's saying, hey, I want my will to, to line up with yours, but if this is possible, you know, let's, let's do this a different way. And it says in verse 43, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Because Jesus was in the, in the flesh, he needed that strength, just like we would, Right? And, and the Father sends this angel to provide that strength to him 
to help him do what is very difficult. And again, you could look at passages like this and, and people who go to the wrong extreme will say, well, I mean, if Jesus needed an angel ministering him, then how could he possibly be God? Right? I mean, you could see how someone would say that. But it's because he was also a man. And, and, and just having that understanding is so critical to being, you know, to having a better relationship, in my opinion, with God, knowing that, hey, Jesus was a man, 100% understands what it's like. And Jesus received this, this angel strengthening him. Verse 44 says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's a big deal. It's a lot of agony and, and just, just, just understanding what's going, going to happen. You know, understanding we have a Savior, we have a high priest that was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That's why the next verse says we could boldly go unto the throne of grace. We can boldly come in because whatever it is that you have, whatever is going on in your life, God's going to be able to understand Show mercy, compassion, love, and strengthen you because he's been through it all. One last point here on Jesus being the Son of Man. At the end of Luke chapter 2, where we're reading, you don't have to turn back there if you want to, but uh, at the end of Luke chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, talking about his parents, jo uh, Mary and Joseph. He was subject unto them. So he was being, even as a child, he was, he was showing respect and honor and being subject unto his earthly parents here and doing what they said to do. And imagine that. I mean, be, a child being without sin, <laughs> that's, that's, that's great, right? <laughs> Although, be, it, it, I wonder how, if it, I wonder if it would be difficult then as a sibling as a half sibling, you know, growing up with the perfect one, right? The firstborn, he's the perfect one. He's always doing everything right. He never tells a lie. He, ne you know. But it says here, but but just demonstrating, you know, again, the physical nature that the human being that Jesus Christ was here, he was subject unto them. And it says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So as he's growing, he's literally physically growing and, and this, this humanity of Jesus Christ is demonstrated here. I mean, how can you grow in wisdom and stature? And again, this is where people get on the wrong side of things and will say, oh, well, how could he be God if he's increasing in wisdom? I mean, God knows everything. Well, it's because in order to accomplish this, again, great is the mystery, but in order to accomplish this, he took on the constraints of a human being while simultaneously remaining God. God able to constrain himself to do something like this is a great mystery. Again, I, don't, I can't give you all of the answers of the understanding because I don't have them. And I, I don't think anybody does. That's why there's not even a controversy about the mystery <laughs> of, the, of God being manifest in the flesh. Um, the reference, I talked about this in, uh, I don't know if I want to get into that right now or not. Turn to, turn to Mark 14. That's, good. That's an important passage I want you to make note of. Because now we're going to look at a lot of references to Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Right? So those were Jesus being the Son of Man, being in the flesh, having these needs, having these necessities, experiencing you know, Jesus, you know, even sorrow when Lazarus died and he saw everyone grieving, you know, pricked him in his heart. The Bible says that Jesus wept. Right? He was... He, he, was, he had that, that experience as well and knows what it's like to, to grieve and to mourn and to lose someone. Even, even though he knew Lazarus could be ra raised from the dead, he still felt that sorrow of heart and grief that, that we all would feel, even though when we know someone who's saved and passes on, is, you know, they're continuing in heaven, it's still a, a loss or a mourning for us here. Um, he understands all of that. What's interesting, though, about Jesus Christ being called the Son of Man, I told you there's one Old Testament reference of that, and that's in the book of Daniel, but then also in the book of Daniel is a reference to the Son of God 
being prophesied as well, essentially. And in Daniel 7, I'll just read these for you. Daniel 7, verse 13, the Bible says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. So this is referring to Jesus Christ coming back in the clouds, right, the rapture. And it says, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Obviously re referring to Jesus Christ coming back and, being, and his kingdom being set up. But it's referred to, he's being referred to as the Son of Man. The only time in the Old Testament that that's, that that's used is this prophecy of the millennial reign of Christ. And then the Son of God, also in Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the fourth of them is, li is like the Son of God. Which is also important to, to see that as well in the Old Testament, that prophecy. Because we know that the Old Testament has prophesied, all the prophets spake of Jesus Christ. And, and who he is and everything. But it's interesting seeing it in both places that. But anyway, take that for what it is. I, I kind of just wanted to throw that out there because I thought that was interesting to see that. But um, when it comes to Jesus being the son of God, the devils knew that he was the son of God. The unclean spirits. The, when he was out casting out devils and he's, he's performing his miracles, of course they knew he was the son of God. Because they're devils. They'd seen him before. They'd seen him before he came to this earth. Because Jesus Christ wasn't created. He's not a created being, as the Jehovah's False Witnesses would want to tell you, that, oh, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, that's when he came into existence or something. No, he's always existed. He's without father, without mother, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Okay? Jesus Christ is God. Part of God is he's, he's eternal. Right? No beginning, no ending. Jesus Christ is. He's the I am of the Bible. And that's why they wanted to stone him, because he said, I am. I am that I am. Right? That's what Moses met in the burning bush. Jesus made that same claim of being Lord. In Mark 3, you're in Mark 14, in Mark 3, 11, the Bible says, And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And that's just one example, but there's many examples throughout the Gospels of him coming across these unclean spirits, coming across these devils, and they're, they're falling down and worshiping him because they know he's the Son of God. But not just the testimony of these devils, right? Because we're not just going to go off of the testimony of the devil calling Jesus the Son of God. Jesus Christ himself claimed that he was the Son of God. Amen. And make note of these passages, because if you ever run into a Muslim, Muslims love to claim that, well, Jesus never said he was the Son of God. Right? Because Muslims will think that, you know, they'll say, oh yeah, we, we receive the teaching of Jesus Christ and of all these holy fathers and, you know, these imams and they'll, they'll look at Abraham and Moses and they'll, and they'll give lip service that, yeah, 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 we, we, we're okay with all those teachings. And they'll even say Jesus Christ. And then, of course, finally with their Muhammad, which is who they're really following, who is under the inspiration of a devil. But, um... They'll, they'll say this, though, they'll say, because we, we try to say, well, you know what, Jesus is different. Jesus isn't just like Abraham. Jesus isn't just like Moses. Jesus is definitely not like Muhammad. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they'll say, you know what, others said that about him, but he never said that. And, and, they'll, and they'll try to trip you up with this. Now, there's not many references, because most of, them, of the references of Jesus Christ being called the Son of God are from other people. His glory is given him of other people, right? But it's not that he never said he was the Son of God. You can see other people saying that. They wanted to kill him because he said that he's the Christ, he's the Son of God, making himself equal with God. You can look at verses like that, but oh, but Jesus wasn't saying that. It was just someone else saying that about him. Well, you're in Mark 14. Look at verse number 61. Verse number 61 of Mark 14. This is when he's being interrogated. 
right? Right before his crucifixion. Verse number 61 says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, does anyone think the reference to the Son of the Blessed means anyone else than the Son of God? I don't think he's referring to Joseph being the son of the blessed. Because they also throw in there that you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the blessed. He's talking about being the son of God. That's what they're asking him. And look what he answers in verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. Amen. I am the Christ. I am the son of the blessed. And ye shall see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So right there, Jesus Christ admitted or said that he is the son of God. He's the son of the blessed. He said, I am. He answered their question directly. He said, I am. In other gospels and other accounts, you're going to see him saying, well, thou sayest. Thou sayest it, right? Sayest this thing of thyself or do you hear it of some other people, right? But in this verse right here in the book of Mark, there's an account of him. There's a witness, a testimony of him saying, you know what? I am. Because they ask him this question multiple times. And, and most of the time he's going to say, yeah, yeah. You're saying that I'm the son of God. You're saying that. But in this instance, he's saying, I am. John chapter 9. Turn over to John chapter 9. Because it's not just Mark 14. Look at John chapter 9. Verse number 35. And this is when he's talking to the man that was healed, who was blind. He says, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? So who is the Son of God? Look at verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with him. The. Amen. So who's talking to him? Jesus. That's right. Look, you've seen him, and it's he that's talking with you. Right? It's me, right? Jesus is the Son of God. He's saying this directly to this person that he's speaking to, that it's me. And then turn over to John chapter 20. Again, another extremely uh, clear passage where he's claiming to be the Son of God, Okay. How many more references do we need of him actually saying it in addition to everyone else saying that he's the Son of God? Right. In addition to the Scripture talking about him being the Son of God, just in general, Old Testament prophecy being the Son of God. John chapter 20, this is after the resur resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's shown himself now unto his disciples and this is where he confronts Doubting Thomas, right? Everyone knows who Doubting Thomas is, a disciple that when Jesus Christ came back, he showed himself to his disciples, and Thomas wasn't there. So they're all telling him, hey, we saw Jesus, right? He's resurrected. He's, you know, we, we've seen him. We talked with him. And he's saying, you know what? I don't believe you guys. I'm not going to believe you unless, unless I could put my, my finger into, into the hole of his nails and put my hand into his side. I'm not going to believe Right? That's what he was saying. He was like, I don't believe that. Unless I need to see it. I need him to be right here. Then I'll believe it. So Jesus makes himself shown now unto Thomas. And he says, well, I'm going you know, to turn there too because I actually I don't, I don't have that part in my note. But it's, a, it's such a great story anyways. Verse 27, the Bible says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. You say, you know what? Come here. Come here, Thomas. Here, give me your hand. Put it right here. Feel it for yourself. Give me your hand. Thrust it into my side. Where they pierced him with that spear in his side. Stop being faithless. Believe. They're resurrected from the dead. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas calls Jesus here after his resurrection, My God. Now, in order for Jesus to be good, 
for Jesus to be right. If Jesus were not God, he would be obligated to tell Thomas, whoa, hold on a minute there, Thomas. Yeah, I resurrected from the dead, but I'm not God. If he weren't God, he'd have to say, there's one God, worship God. Don't worship me. Don't call me God. But in fact, he does the opposite. The opposite. He says, verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Believed what? My Lord and my God. Now you finally believe because you've seen me. He confirms what he just said, my Lord and my God, because he is. Amen. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. Critical doctrine, we need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not just a man. Now, he is a man. He was a man, right? But not just any man. And not just a man that you can attain to. He's God. Turn, if you go to 1 John chapter 5. Salvation can only come through the Son of God. There is no other Savior. It's not going to come through Muhammad. It's not going to come through Joseph Smith. It's not coming through Michael the Archangel, because that's who the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was, actually, if you, if you understand what they believe, which is just damnable heresy. Salvation can only come through the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, so many great verses here. We're going to start reading in verse number 5. And we're going to see again so some more uh, scripture about the Trinity, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but um, I want to point, just point more and focus more on the salvation through the Son of God. That it, that it's important that it's the Son of God. It's Jesus Christ, yes, but he's the Son of God. Verse number 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth, that Jesus is the Son of God. So who is he that doesn't overcome the world? He that doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The unbelieving Pharisees and Jews that rejected him and said it was blasphemy that he called himself the Son of God. They haven't overcome the world. This is he, verse 6, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. Again, making that important distinction that he was physically born into this, into this world, not just by water. It wasn't just his water birth. Like, it wasn't just God being born from a womb, but not really being a human being and not being in the flesh. He was born by water and blood. He had blood running through his veins. Now, we know that in our glorified bodies, at least we could deduce that we're not going to need blood. Right now, the blood is the life of the flesh. But when it talks about the glorified body, it talks about flesh and bone. And Jesus Christ is the life. We won't need that blood giving life. Jesus Christ shed his blood for our life. And, you know, we go on and on. That's a whole other topic and, and, and area of discussion. But it's, it's still demonstrating the importance of him being born by water and blood. That he's physically born as a human being, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There's your trinity. There's three. Father, Word, Holy Ghost. And I'm gonna, in another sermon, I'm going to talk about Jesus being the Word, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you know, that's, a, that's another, uh, another topic for an, in the series. But Jesus Christ is the Word. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. They're three. Absolutely, they're three. We've seen many places where that's, that's been identified that they're three. But it says these three are one. Okay, and that's where we get the Trinity word, three in one. That's what it means. 
So, yo, know, you can't find the word Trinity in the Bible. Yeah, I know, but the concept's there. It doesn't matter. Call it whatever you want. You put a, a label on it or a name on it. But three in one is in Scripture. These three are one. Verse number eight, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Verse number nine, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Again, the reverence to believing on the Son of God. Not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So anyone that has a Savior that's not the Son of God does not have life. You have to have the Son of God. It's vital. Verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And interestingly enough, in, in Acts 8, you guys probably know this verse already, Acts 8.37 uh, is an important verse because we also demonstrate to those who, who aren't aware of the differences between the Bible versions out there. Because in, in this church, we're a King James only church, if, if you haven't recognized that and see, like, why, or, you know, this doesn't match up with my Bible. If this doesn't match up with your Bible, you need to get a new Bible. We've got them out in the foyer. We're happy to give you one. Um, but if you go to any of these modern versions and you go to Acts chapter 8, you're going to notice there's a verse missing. It's a very, very important verse, by the way. Turn, turn to Acts chapter 8 because I want you to see this if you've never seen this before. And it ties in perfectly with, with what I'm teaching this morning about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now what you'll probably find if you have a modern version of the Bible, modern meaning like an NIV or an NASB or whatever, these other, these other perversions of God's Word that actually say different things than what the King James Bible says. They're, they're, not, you know, they're not the same. It's not just, oh, it's a little bit different, or oh, they took out the these and the thous. It's actually significantly different. There's big differences, major differences between the scriptures because they're using different sources. Their source manuscripts are different, so you can't get the same translations when you're using different underlying documents than you are one version or another. It's not just, oh, someone had this preference of using this synonym over that synonym. It's, that's not all it is. If that is all, all it were, then it wouldn't be nearly as big of a deal, but but there's literally just verses not there and things added and things removed and just, it's different, significantly different. And you'll see that here in this story. Look at verse number 35 in Acts chapter 8. The Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached on him Jesus. So he's, he's, he, he met this eunuch and this guy, like, he's reading the Bible. He doesn't understand what he's reading. And Philip's saying, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He's saying, how can I accept some man should guide me? So he invites him up in his chariot and he's there. And now he's starting to preach Jesus Christ unto him. It's an important story because he's, he's, he's preaching the gospel to him. He's preaching Jesus Christ unto this man. And it says in verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Hey, there's water right here. Why can't I be baptized? If you're reading a modern version, the answer to his question is omitted. It's removed. Why can't I be baptized? Well, the modern versions say, well, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. Now, they don't say these exact words, right? But it, it jumps down to verse 38, where in verse 38, in the King James Bible, it says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Well, apparently nothing is preventing you from getting baptized. Because the modern versions don't even have the answer to the question. Which also attacks the doctrine of baptism, which is why it's so easier, so much easier for, these, for churches to be baptizing babies. And baptizing infants and just you know, doing all these baptisms. Well, what does hinder me baptism? I guess nothing. Nothing is. You know, there is something that prevents people from being baptized. And this is why we don't just baptize anybody here. Right. Now, we've got, bapt we got a baptismal tub ready to go. We're ready to fill it up. I love doing baptisms. We're Baptists. <laughs> we love doing baptisms. Amen. But there's a condition that needs to be met before you get baptized. 
And there's a verse in the Bible that's, that needs to be in the Bible to see that condition. And it's verse number 37. So when he says, What doth hinder me baptized? Verse 37 says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. Amen. You tell me that a, a six-month-old, a 12-month-old is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart? They don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know much about anything. I mean, they're infants. They're little, right? There's, there's... You have to believe. And you know, anyone who wants to get baptized here, amen, I'd love to baptize you, but you know what? You've got to have a testimony of salvation. You've got to have a testimony that your faith is residing in Jesus Christ before we go through with the baptism. Amen. That you understand what it means to be saved, that it's, your trust is in Him. He did the work. He's the one who died on the cross. He's the one who rose again from the dead. It's not you and your life that's going to save you. It's his life and what he did for you that saves you. Amen. You don't give your life to him. He gave his life for you. Amen. That's what saves you. Amen. Now, we ought to live our life for him after he saves you. We should. We should show our gratitude and our love and, and God, you did all this for me. I want to serve you. But that does not save you at all. Does not save you. Jesus saves you. That's why he's called the Savior. You're not the Savior. You can't save yourself. You need to call on him to save you. And what he did and who he is, being the son of God and the son of man, he's able to save you. Completely. No work of your own involved at all. Just call on him. He'll save you. But you have to be trusting in him. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And look what he answered. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Him making that statement unto Philip, saying, hey, if you believe all your heart, you know what? I do believe. What do you believe? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right. Then he baptizes him. He's putting his trust in the Son of God. It's important doctrine, basic doctrine. I think, I think most everyone here, if not everyone here, probably already believes. But you know, we need to reinforce these things. Amen. We need to make sure that we don't just, because it's easy, especially when you don't cover the fundamentals and the basics. If it's been a real long time since you've even thought about them, there's all kinds of weird doctrine out there. There's all kinds of people that have just bizarre ideas. And if that's all you're hearing, even your own thoughts can start to get a little bit skewed. And just a little bit off base. Of, you know, I'm not saying you're just going to you know, jump over into some cult and, oh man, well, Jesus isn't the same. You know, but it's important to know these things. And you know, it's also important to be able to show people, like I mentioned the Muslims, what the scripture really says. Because they don't know. They don't know. They hear from other teachers. The reason why so many Muslims repeat that, well, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, because they hear that. Because that's what they're being taught. That's what, and they don't go through and look through every verse of the Bible and see, well, is that really true? They're not, because if they did, they'd find the verses that I showed you today. But we should know those verses. We should be able to show someone, well, no, he, he's the Son of God. We should be able to demonstrate that. So, so use your, your notes and take notes of those scriptures and, you know, know them to be able to explain them. Even just one of them. I'm excited about this series because, you know, sometimes it's hard, it's hard to come up with sermons. And I'm thinking, man, what do people need to hear? What do we, you know, nothing wrong about preaching more about Jesus. <laughs> let's, let's, let's focus back on the Savior and just kind of, just highlight so much about Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to that. Tonight, we're going to be preaching on uh, Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. Okay, so if you're interested in what we're, what's going on tonight's sermon, different from today, Lamb of God. And we'll go through all the reasons why he's called the Lamb of God. Uh, we saw it here this morning. He's called the Son of Man, Son of God. He's also called the Lamb of God. He's also the Word. We're, you know, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of, of topics 
focused on Jesus Christ. And we're going to spend some time focusing on Jesus Christ and just learning more about our Savior in the coming weeks. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your word and for the gift that is offered unto us, dear Lord, and that, that ultimate payment that was made. Father, of the, the sacrifice that, that you gave of your only begotten Son, uh, Jesus Christ, and, and the sacrifice that he made for us to, to be willing to, to give of his, own, of his own life and to suffer all that he suffered for us, dear Lord. Thank you for that. I pray that you would please help us in our understanding. Lord, help us to just to have a more perfect knowledge and understanding of who you are, of who Jesus is, to be able to just serve you better and to honor you better, Lord, and to be able to just uh, to tell others about you. We, we, we don't want to have any misconceptions or false ideas about who you are since, since you're so important to us. You're everything to us, Lord. You're our life. And um, we, we love you. We, just, we need you to help our, our feeble human minds to be able to understand uh, the greatness and the glory that you, that, that you are. And uh, God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.